遊泳体育祭が迫ってる So, apparently, I love My Hero Academia more than I thought I did. Particularly this season because, as fans of the channel no doubt are aware of, I love tournament arcs with a burning passion. Whether it be Dragon Ball, Hunter x Hunter, Yu Yu Hakusho, or indeed My Hero Academia, there's just something about this format I find so captivating, and in the context of this very story, I actually had a lot more to say about it than I thought I would. This week, we're covering double the chapters and episodes, which means. Pray for me and my editors as we dive into a personal favorite of mine from this series. One where we explore never before seen matchups, uncover characters that have yet to make themselves known, and explore the uneasy ethics of this hero driven society. The cast of My Hero Academia is about to blow up yet again, and I can't wait to break down how Horikoshi managed to weave all of this together. I'm Totally Not Mark, and this is my comprehensive analysis and review for My Hero Academia Season 2. In season one, I explored the narrative concept of internal and external conflicts. Looking within characters like Midoriya during the entrance exam, the quirk assessment tests, and pretty much every other activity he took part in. These external challenges exposed and complemented the inner conflicts of those involved, and through that created an incredible sense of tension. But this is season two, which means we gotta step it up a notch. As has been made evident through the reveal of Shigaraki and his goons, one day for these students, their greatest adversaries won't be their own internal demons, but rather the very real ones that populate the streets they will no doubt one day swear to defend. And so today, what I hope to focus on is not an individual's internal struggle coming into conflict with a tough situation, but rather two opposing individuals with their own inner turmoil coming into conflict with one another. I'm talking obstacle courses, cavalry battles, not really sure what that is, and of course, the tried and true manga staple, a 1v1 tournament arc. <laughs> The UA Sports Festival is framed right from the outset as a mechanism through which students can show the viewers, both in the stadium and at home, their abilities and what they're made of, all in the hopes of securing future employment or, at the very least, work experience. Similar to other past arcs, Horikoshi leverages the expectations of the students and teachers to juxtapose with Midoriya's objective to use the festival not for his own personal gain, but to instead announce to the world that he is here, that the future he represents is secure. In the last video, I would have looked at what this juxtaposition said about Midoriya specifically, but I think the more interesting conversation to have here is what the novelty or rarity of this ambition Midoriya has says about the broader hero society. And wonderfully, Horikoshi uses this element to make this arc more interesting and to help establish the themes of what will be tackled shortly. And that's what this section of the story does exceptionally well. The events feel not only cohesive, but almost thematically inseparable. The obstacle course and the cavalry battle, while competitions filled with tremendous spectacle offering a chance to introduce us to or better acquaint ourselves with new characters, is all established under an ethically questionable framework. While the flashy and powerful Todoroki and Bakugo rush towards the finish line, creating the perfect opportunity for another one of Midoriya's wonderfully inventive solutions to win the race, there are others involved in this competition from the lower classes like 1B, General Studies, and the support crew that don't receive the proper recognition or spotlight. And not because their quirks are weak and unsuited to hero work, but because the tests are, as Aizawa puts it, biased in favor of those with certain abilities. And to better illustrate this problem, Horikoshi introduces two new characters, initially framed as devious antagonists, called Monoma and Shinzo. I think this is super clever. While the focus of this arc is largely and rightfully on the tournament, the initial obstacle course followed up with the cavalry battle is a really nice narrative one two punch. With the course being tackled like any other challenge by Class 1A, that is with 100% effort, it facilitates the unexpected but reasonable approach taken by Class 1B and beneath. Well, okay, to a degree at least. Due to its unfair design, as I mentioned, favoring those with physical offensive mobility quirks, characters like Shinso are forced to get creative, initially hanging back in the obstacle course race to secure a less desirable headband to take into that contest. 
Monoma, however, is such an individual that takes this approach to an extreme, and the difference here is that it's not due to his lack of ability, but rather his lack of ambition and drive to always try his best. Which created a feverishly fun game of cat and mouse between him and Bakugo when he managed to nab all of his points. Suffice it to say, you don't want to get between Bakugo and victory, certainly not if you're not willing to try your best to do so. In the case of both the cavalry battle and the obstacle course, I think Horikoshi did a fantastic job of establishing not just some new fun energetic characters with fascinating quirks, but did so while driving at an interesting issue within this hero society, one that has been hinted at as far back as the first chapter or episode. And now, heading into the first round of the tournament, with Midoriya and Todoroki having established a clear interest in defeating each other, Horikoshi hits us with another unexpected and somewhat mysterious matchup. Midoriya vs Shinso I can conceive of no better bout to begin this tournament with. Because its conclusion ends up reverberating long after this festival comes to a close, Hitoshi Shinso is the physical embodiment of exactly the type of student UA system has disenfranchised, and fittingly, this entire fight explores that very topic. Despite what UA has been framed as, it is not an equal playing field. In chapter 22, the very first chapter of this arc, Aizawa discloses that this tournament is a valuable chance to gain experience and popularity if they are noticed and picked up by a big named hero. But as we've discovered, this contest cannot and has not accounted for some of the most remarkable quirks we've ever seen in this story. Quirks like Shinzo's that would objectively be incredibly powerful in the right setting, enabling him to become a truly incredible hero. However, as we learned, he failed the entrance exam. Which honestly makes sense, how could he not? Defeating giant robots isn't exactly in his skill set, and yet, contending with Midoriya in this first round, who need I remind you was capable of taking down the largest and most dangerous robot during that entrance exam, Shinzo is managing to march him out of bounds without so much as lifting a single finger. But unfortunately for him, Midoriya can. This is, of course, Midoriya we're talking about, and he's not about to be eliminated in the first round. But that's not to say his win here is devoid of meaning either. For Midoriya, there's a deep underlying sense of guilt at play, a feeling that he isn't worthy of the position he's been placed in. Shinzo admonishes Midoriya for being a gifted person, that he could never understand how someone like him has to struggle in this world with the ambitions he has. And while I'm sure hearing such intense and targeted accusations must have been incredibly difficult for Midoriya, what ultimately secured his victory wasn't one for all. It wasn't this gift he had, it was his own strength. The training he earnestly put his body through in the last year made the difference between them. It goes back to what Aizawa tried to instill in him, that he needs to find a way to not be a one-trick pony, and for Shinso, despite possessing this incredible quirk, he had little else to offer other than a defeatist attitude. Bakugo vs Ochiko This is one of my favorite fights in this arc, and looking at the combatants, it's honestly easy to see why. Unlikely and contrasting pairings are exactly why I gravitate towards tournament arcs with such enthusiasm. While a large portion of the story has contended with the unfortunate disadvantages a lot of students are forced to contend with due to how UA operates, it has also been about what drives each student to become a hero. For Midoriya, he wants to altruistically save people, to reassure them with a smile like All Might did for him. For Ida, he wants to continue his family's legacy and specifically make his older brother proud. And for Ochiko, she wants to become a hero to earn money. And not for herself, for her parents, to lessen the financial burden they endure. However, there's a little more to this matchup than the potential of monetary gain for Ochiko. Prior to this match, sitting in the locker room nervous out of her mind, she expresses to Midoriya who offers a strategy that, since she's known him, he has been this incredible person, achieving incredible things, and that recently, she's felt as though that she's used this aspect of him to cover her own suspected inadequacies. Because of this, she goes into this match not just with her parents in mind, but a deep determination to give it her all and to try to prove to herself that she deserves to call Ida, Midoriya, and indeed Bakugo peers. This is where Ochiko transformed from just a side character I was lukewarm on and became one of my favorites. There are a number of moments here where you can tell she's just thinking to herself, what would Midoriya do? And the results are not only endearing, but remarkably effective. 
One of the toughest things a tournament arc can contend with is how to deal with matchups of varying strength, while importantly keeping the honor and intrigue of the two characters intact. How do you have someone like Krillin, for example, fight someone like Piccolo without it being a complete curb stop? How do you have Ochiko fight someone as overwhelmingly ahead of the pack as Bakugo without making her seem incredibly weak to the point of disinterest? Well, of course, in both cases, the answer is simple. You let the obvious outcome play to fruition while allowing the underdog to put up a surprisingly compelling fight. It is a great sleight of hand on Horikoshi's part to have Ochiko get completely and utterly decimated, literally not even scratching Bakugo, but still managing to make her feel very formidable and worthy in the process. This was a wonderful fight in more ways than one. It elevated Ochigo, it highlighted the honor of Bakugo, and quite elegantly, whether Midoriya believes she's justified to feel this way or not, is one of the first moments he has moved another to act. Not unlike how All Might inspired him, Midoriya is starting to inspire and drive others to better themselves and dream for more than they ever thought they were capable of. Whether they be Ochiko, Bakugo, or Todoroki. <laughs> Todoroki vs. Midoriya Unlike every other arc thus far in this story, according to Horikoshi himself, this was Todoroki's arc and was initially designed around introducing us to his character, his past, and of course, his difficult, character-defining, toxic relationship with his own father, Endeavor. This is the most overt example of internal conflict within two characters causing friction in this arc, and one that unfortunately manifested in a horribly negative outcome, where an abusive and neglectful father contends with his own demons of inadequacy, leading to his son's ultimate rejection of and hatred for who and what he is. And while this bout between himself and Midoriya is phenomenal, I think it achieves the heights it eventually does in part because of how Horikoshi framed Todoroki and Endeavor's relationship. You see, while they are the first tragic consequence of two internal conflicts coming to blows, they are not the first to utilize this dynamic in the story. Midoriya and All Might demonstrate that a dynamic between two characters that suffer with an internal conflict does not need to manifest into something evil or abusive. From the very beginning of this story, Midori has felt a tremendous pressure from society to be something that he's not, to just accept that he isn't a hero. Simultaneously, All Might 2 feels a tremendous pressure from society to be something he isn't anymore, an unshakable symbol of peace. When put together, these two internal conflicts don't create more chaos, but in fact help to resolve each other. All Might helps Midoriya become the new symbol of peace to become an unshakable hero like he always wanted, and through doing so, Midoriya allows All Might the chance to finally let his guard down, to rest, and pass the torch. And that is the core message of this arc, that the conflicts that dwell within you do not need to define who you are. <laughs> Todoroki treats this fight like his father wants him to treat it, with Midoriya as this ceremonial stand-in for All Might, thinking that if he refuses to use his left side, he will somehow prove that he's not his father, that he's not his puppet or creation, but his own person. However, and this applies to not just this specific contest, if your choice to behave is dictated by someone else's reaction, then you aren't doing it for yourself and are still, in a sense, a slave to them and their influence. In reading this manga in retrospect, I think its circumstance is rather funny. That Midoriya, a character that has struggled to call this power he possesses anything but his own, who cannot accept himself as anything other than unworthy, challenges Todoroki to accept himself and his powers. To think of it not as a piece of his father, but one half of who he is. Ironically, Midoriya encourages Todoroki to aim not to defeat the stand-in for All Might, but to instead dedicate himself entirely to fighting he, Midoriya, as he actually is, a fellow classmate trying his hardest to win. Only then will the victory represent something he did for himself and not his father. On the fighting front, I am really enjoying this exploration into what quirks are and what limitations they have. In the case of this fight, Todoroki's refusal to use half of his powers leads to extreme fatigue on his right side. Like any muscle, if you overburden it, eventually it will become damaged and compromised. And conversely, like Midoriya is demonstrating, heeding the advice of his teachers and earnestly training manifests in a greater control of his own abilities. A control that backs Todoroki, now completely fatigued, into a literal and emotional corner.
Overall, I think this is a very nice battle. While not as good as Midoriya vs Bakugo in terms of character writing and narrative, in terms of action and certainly animation in the anime, it's a class into and of itself, and on top of that, a great and meaningful fight to boot. With Midoriya, despite losing, he can hold his head up high, for he achieved his primary goal to save Todoroki from himself. And for Todoroki, he too took the first step in accepting who he is and overcoming a trauma that he's carried with him since childhood. While only one advances to the next round, both combatants leave as winners. In the introduction of this video, I expressed that I was a massive fan of the tournament arc format. I mean, you need only look at my analysis of Dragon Ball's tournaments as evidence for this. And while I did, as you have already and will continue to see, admire a great deal of this tournament, I do also have my criticisms, which is interesting because I think Horikoshi and I agree. In the opening of Volume 5, in his author's note, he writes, I've been waiting to write a tournament arc since I was a little kid. Now that I've done it, I see that it's a ridiculously difficult thing to pull off. And at the very end of that same volume, he expands on this statement, stating, When I was putting this arc together in my mind, it was going to be a vehicle for Todoroki's development. There'd be two chapters for the obstacle race, one for the interlude, two for the cavalry battle, and about five for the tournament itself. That was the grand plan, but when I started drawing, I realized I needed to showcase all of these different characters, so it couldn't be as succinct as I'd imagined. The reason I highlight these difficulties at all Horikoshi has shared is due to them granting validity to my own criticisms of this arc's weakest area, which ironically should be a tournament's strongest. And that is its ability to bond us with and expose us to the struggles of new characters. On one hand, Horikoshi has achieved what he set out to do. We are all now invested in Todoroki. However, with Midoriya now eliminated, all we have left to do at this point is to wait for the inevitable finale between Todoroki and Bakugo. Which wouldn't have been an issue if that match was next. But there are four individual fights between now and then that offer very little in the way of story progression and new information. Now, before I explore those matchups, I'm not suggesting that the notion of pitting an unknown character against a fan favorite is a bad idea. Because it isn't, as made evident through my analysis of Midoriya vs Shinso. That fight and even Ida's matchup against Hatsume perfectly tied into the established themes of this narrative and continued our understanding of the world and those involved. That's how these tournaments are supposed to work. But I think when it comes to Bakugo vs Kirishima, and certainly the semi-finals with Ida vs Todoroki and Bakugo vs Tokoyami, while these did offer some nice character moments, it was obvious, at least to me, that they were more of a hurdle of circumstance than an intended and coordinated piece of storytelling, and the result of having Todoroki and Midoriya fight so early on in this tournament. Bakugo's fight with Kirishima continues to allude to what we already learned about Bakugo through his matchup with Ochiko, and we didn't learn anything new from Kirishima that we haven't already been made aware of thanks to earlier in the tournament or even during USJ to some extent. But when it came to the semi-finals, this was even more obvious to me. Where famous tournament arcs from the past have leveraged their semi-final rounds to explore complicated themes within the main characters destined for the finals and offer their opponents opportunities to really establish themselves in ways that made sense to the story, Ida vs Todoroki, despite utilizing two characters we know rather well, suffered from a rather boring dynamic and a surprising lack of substantial or new content. And hey, I'll be the first one to say it. Using lesser fights as an opportunity to cut away for exposition to other areas of the story is neither a novel nor a necessarily bad concept. Which is why I haven't criticized most of the earlier matchups in much detail. And let me tell you, there's a lot of them. But when it comes to both of the semi-final matchups, that's when I started to take issue. Ida and Todoroki's matchup is not about the story of the fight, but instead Ida's reaction to his eventual loss. To its credit, the aftermath at least contributes to furthering the story in some small way, but I would argue, similar to the following matchup between Bakugo and Tokoyami, not anywhere near enough to merit its placement as a semi-final match. With Bakugo's fight specifically once again retreading with Tokoyami, the same story we've been exposed to during his prior two battles. Outs. Due to this, Tokoyami gains little benefit despite receiving some focus early on in this story. You could argue that during these matchups we establish some sense of who the strongest was, but even that is a tenuous suggestion given that the whole point of this story, and arc really, is to demonstrate that raw ability isn't what determines whether or not someone is deserving or capable of being a great hero. 
both of the semi-finals, while they did indeed lead to an appropriate final round, were radically subpar matches that contributed very little, if anything, to the narrative compared to their earlier and later counterparts. This, I think, is a direct result of Horikoshi's express lack of foresight and experience with this format. He went in with the ambition of telling a story that would fit brilliantly within 10 chapters, but was forced to stretch that story to over twice its length when he realized the true scope of what the arc demanded. Hey, where have I heard that before? To me, it's clear that when looking at this arc, and indeed at this series in general, Horikoshi is a big fan of Dragon Ball. He's openly admitted that he's based All Might on Goku, he's produced art in tribute of Akira Toriyama himself, and in looking closely at how he approached this tournament, I see a host of similarities there also. But in truth, due to this contest's extensive scope and comparatively limited content, I think following Midoriya's defeat against Todoroki, he should have taken inspiration from one of the most unexpected and intelligent choices any mangaka I've read has made in writing a tournament. In my opinion, he should have gone with Togashi's approach. Togashi's approach with Gon in having him pass out during the Hunter exams could have given Horikoshi the opportunity to only relay the necessary information from the lackluster semi-finals, all the while free them up to still show us the finals between Bakugo and Todoroki as it exists today. Heck, he could have even ended it all with a revelation of what Ida learned happened to his brother all within a streamlined time frame. But to Horikoshi's defense, all of what I've just suggested is easy for me to point out retroactively. And considering this was his very first tournament arc, outside of a few less than stellar moments, it was stuffed with some brilliantly executed, action-packed, and thematically resonant battles I still hold fondly to this day. And among those I hold in high regard is indeed what comes next. Bakugo vs Todoroki Back in the day when I first laid eyes on this battle, I was beyond hyped to see how Bakugo and Todoroki would settle this growing conflict. As I pointed out, while the narrative counterpart to Todoroki's character in this story was Midoriya, what Horikoshi managed to squeeze out of Bakugo in his progression through this festival was nothing short of entrancing. Having come into this already being a massive fan of the character, getting to see what a true victory means to someone like Bakugo and the lengths he would go to to get it felt extremely exciting to watch, particularly during the cavalry battle where he effectively will his team to victory, albeit in a slightly terrifying way. The distinction Bakugo makes between a true victory and a ceremonial one speaks specifically to his relationship with Midoriya and the insecurities that stem from that. He wants to defeat everyone, but only if they are going all out, not holding back. To hold back for Bakugo is the height of disrespect, and that is made all the more evident through both his reactions during and the comments he made after his first round against Ochako. She was formidable, and he fought and defeated her to the best of his abilities because she earned that. Because she deserved that. That's awesome character writing and feeds perfectly into this battle with Todoroki. Like Midoriya did, can Bakugo draw out the fire he wants from Todoroki, both figuratively and literally? Or will he fail to achieve what Midoriya was able to do yet again? There's a lot on the line here for Todoroki, certainly, but more than victory, this decision is what ultimately determined whether or not Bakugo will meet his goal. <laughs> Where I felt as though the Midoriya vs Todoroki fight was less emphatic in the manga, I gotta say, this fight does not have that same problem at all. You can just tell that Horikoshi is really having fun and getting creative with his application of both of their powers. Up until now, I had felt that in quite a few places, despite the art being next level, the panel layouts were somewhat busy. So much so that I'd venture to say that had this been my first time consuming this story, I could have found it annoying to parse some of the information during specific sections. But this battle is honestly beautiful! There's a wonderful emphasis on movement while keeping us aware of where these characters are in relation to one another. It's just so fun. But the best part of this fight primarily can be seen in its closing moments. And it perfectly ties back to what I was saying earlier about the inner conflicts of opposing characters coming into and informing the conflict with each other. Bakugo doesn't care about winning so much as he cares about being dominant. And he can only do that if Todoroki tries his hardest. If he uses his left side whereas Todoroki is on the verge of a mental break. The framework through which he has lived his entire life has been broken down by Midoriya, and now he doesn't know which way is up. He has no conviction in what he believes in anymore. And so, in this battle, we have Bakugo, a character with limitless conviction in himself, but whose victory hinges on the actions of his opponent, placing enormous pressure on Todoroki to attack with everything he's got, and on the other hand, we have Todoroki, a young man whose conviction has been long since shattered and is now at the point he can't take it anymore. Impactor! 
Losing the battle train to Midoriya wasn't necessarily what got to Bakugo. It was that Midoriya successfully got the better of and outsmarted him in the heat of battle. Reinforcing this point, this match ends with Bakugo as the winner, but not with the victory he wanted. A meaningless one. Once again, Bakugo finds himself in Midoriya's shadow. Midoriya might have lost, but he did so honorably, forcing Todoroki to use everything that he's got. All the while Bakugo won, but did so with a giant caveat, unable to bring that level of vigor out of Todoroki. The Hero Killer Stain arc is one of my favorites as it explores one of the foundational principles this entire story rests upon. It asks the important question, what does it mean to be a hero? Throughout this series, but predominantly the UA Sports Festival, Horikoshi has been drawing our attention to an unnoticed, or rather widely accepted, bias towards certain students in UA as well as the potential misplaced priorities within this story's universe. The beginning of this arc is set up such that Midoriya's, now Deku's, classmates all begin their internships with active, real-life heroes. Though these kids have faced villains before, there's an exciting bit of anticipation Horikoshi bakes into this sequence as we watch them all take their first proper steps into actual hero work. But there's a catch. In the past, Horikoshi has said that the learning to be a hero aspect of superhero narratives is what he loves the most. However, and I think this is rather creative, instead of leaning into paying off that anticipation in a positive fashion, he largely subverts it. Sorry. What I found interesting about these short introductions between Class 1A and the mentors they've selected is that the vast majority of them talk about stuff you'd think wouldn't be of paramount importance to a hero in the truest sense. Stuff like how they get paid, why they get paid, and in some cases, how they spend some of their time carrying out other activities that have absolutely nothing to do with actual heroism. Naturally, this grants some credence to the ideology Stain espouses with such conviction. He claims that there are few true heroes out there other than All Might anymore. That this society they live in is in need of a purge of these pretenders, these fake heroes. However, despite taking this path and having spent a considerable amount of the prior arc highlighting the notable shortcomings of this society, finally Horikoshi starts to show his hand. While initially played for laughs, Gran Torino's entire character communicates that appearances can not only be deceiving, but they also do not matter. Unlike the other heroes, Gran Torino's approach is very much that of a lost generation. When I first read this arc, I noticed that there were moments in its beginning that subtly pointed to an absence of what once was. Like on the bus, Deku is praised by an older individual claiming his actions at the tournament reminded them of the good old days. Or in Kirishima is inspired by the likes of the classic hero Crimson Riot when formulating his own hero name. While this arc is clearly about students learning the true values of heroism, it also offers subtle commentary on how that society fosters that generation. Gran Torino is our first introduction to that commentary explicitly. His disregard for the glamour of hero work is reflected not only in his words, but also reflected in the derelict dwelling he resides within, as well as the modest lifestyle he's chosen to lead. A lot of this is framed for comedy, but free of concern of things like popularity polls and online footprints, what was once an unserious atmosphere suddenly gives way to valuable and rare insights yet unheard for Deku. <laughs> Gran Torino is the first and only individual so far to actually tangibly help Deku achieve a breakthrough with One For All. He doesn't go easy on him, he doesn't even try to give him the answer to his problems. Instead, he simply highlights Deku's core issue and creates space for him to find his own solution. No longer looking at where he needs to be, trying desperately to force this square peg into a triangular hole, Torino has given him space to think. Additionally, despite being a background player, Shigaraki shares a very similar path in this arc, with his mentor All For One taking the very same approach Torino did. He allows Shigaraki space to make and observe his mistakes so that in time, he too can learn from them, understanding that it's not the goal you shoot for, but the path you take to achieve it that's important. Truly, this is valuable insight for both of these characters. I only wish I could say the same for Ida. 
僕の名前を生涯忘れるなインゲニウムお前を倒すヒーローの名だ As any fan of this channel will tell you, I am no stranger to fights within the shonen genre. They offer a simple yet compelling framework through which an author can explore complicated ideas in an easy to understand format. In the case of Dragon Ball, Goku vs. Vegeta explored the philosophical argument of nature vs. nurture, asking the question is Vegeta naturally superior due to his genetics, or is the guidance Goku received during his formative years enough to give him the edge on this occasion? This is all to say that the purpose of a fight in fiction is to explore potentially complicated issues in the service of reaching some sort of conclusion. And in the case of My Hero Academia's Stain fight, that complicated issue is a twisted ideology in the form of Chizome Akaguro, otherwise known as the hero killer Stain. This character is the extreme consequence of the biased hero education system and the questionable priorities of the modern hero that we've all been exposed to in this tale. Radicalized to the point of extreme violence, now on a murderous spree to purge this world of its fakes and pretenders. As seen, Ida's initial attack and arrival is framed brilliantly. Intervening during a moment that could have been this victim's last, he offers a dramatic declaration that he, as Inganium, the inheritor of his brother's mantle, is here to take down this vile terrorist in the name of his fallen brother. Void of context, this scene for both characters feels remarkably traditional, if not downright heroic. However, nothing could be farther from the truth. And it's in those nitty gritty details Horikoshi explores that I believe he does some of his best work. For those willing to pay attention to the smaller details, this arc is written such that by the time Ida picks this fight, makes this dramatic speech, and Stain responds, we technically have all the info we need to discern Stain's quirk, how it works, and why so many on the police report escaped despite their injuries. While Stain ambushes and paralyzes supposed fake heroes, he also detests villains as seen during his rejection of Shigaraki's proposal. He's not a standard villain, he's a dangerous ideologue. This is clear right away as he offers his prey and Ida on a number of occasions the chance to redeem themselves or simply run away. Not seeking to target those virtuous nor juvenile, but there is one thing Stain detests more than anything else a quality that strikes. To the root of his obsession with these terrorizing acts, he hates those who pose as heroes when they are anything but. And unfortunately for Ida, as made evident through his reaction to his brother's attack, through his impulse to seek out Stain, and even Midoriya's own valid expressed concerns for him, once he delivers this final speech, we understand that there's no longer any question in Stain's mind. Not only will this kid not leave, but now. He cannot allow him to escape. Fittingly, Deku's presence here is one that radiates with heroism Stain can actually acknowledge and even admire. In this moment, Ida, beginning to comprehend the danger of the circumstance not just for himself but for his loyal friend, starts to beg Deku to leave him, to escape for his own good, explaining that this is his fight and it's his mess to deal with. However, Through requesting this, he highlights the very priorities Stain detests within him. For in true Deku fashion, in keeping with his desire to be a hero, he's not going to, nor can he, abandon someone in need. While this moment rightfully serves as a wake up call for Ida to realign and start thinking as a hero once again, what this choice by Deku achieves to stand his ground, to not give up in the face of overwhelming pressure, specifically in this arc, is subtle. But brilliant, offering a catharsis not just by helping Ida find his way again, but through doing so simultaneously proves Stain's ideology entirely incorrect. <laughs> Despite this being a great surprise, one that we could have even predicted by seeing the agency Shoto eyeballed and through seeing Endeavor moments ago, what this save represents, more than a simple surprise, is a payoff of Deku's desire to not give up on people. Much the same as Bakugo, Ochiko, and Ida, Deku cannot abandon someone who looks like they need help. Despite going against all of his own personal interests to win the tournament and declare that the future symbol of peace is on its way, he casts all of that to the side in favor of saving Todoroki. 
from himself, even if it meant that he would lose. And it's that determination to save people, to not lose hope in who they can be, that made this battle with Todoroki so resonant. It's what makes his refusal to leave Ida's side so powerful, and it's that very quality to change for the better that Stain's violent ideology does not account for. <laughs> However, despite Stain's beliefs having very clear flaws, despite his terrorizing and obviously abhorrent behavior, there is a compelling nugget of truth at the foundations of his worldview. That a truly hero-based society should not place its values on self-interest, popularity, or monetary gain. For those qualities are not just unbefitting of altruistic heroes, but are additionally the very forces that risk to corrupt them entirely. We've seen this very concern materialize in characters like Endeavor, consumed by this perception that he will never be the number one hero next to All Might, an obsession that festers and manifests in what we see today with his wife and child, an obsession born of pointless ego. In the sports festival, characters like Monoma and Shinso felt as though they were at enough of a disadvantage such that they either felt it was advisable to take a shortcut and not try, or become downright defeated entirely by it to the point they failed to work on any of their other attributes. Regardless of what you think of their approaches, it's difficult to deny that the systems in place didn't push them in that direction. And in Stain's mind, this system, this society, it creates deeply flawed heroes, and more than that, heroes that shouldn't exist. Stain's fatal flaw is that his ideology doesn't see heroes as people. No one can live up to the ideals of purely altruistic heroes. Not Ida, not Todoroki, nor even Deku for that matter. That's what makes it an ideal. It's unreachable. Even All Might, who Stain uses as the benchmark against which every hero should be measured, doesn't realize that even he is a caricature, an intentionally sensational symbol of all that is righteous and good because he feels as though people need someone like that to believe in. But as we've seen throughout this story, All Might is capable of making mistakes and places his priorities incorrectly like all of us do, sometimes to the detriment of those around him, because he's not perfect. But Stain doesn't recognize this. Unlike Deku, Stain didn't have a Gran Torino in his life to teach him the dangers and shortcomings of idolizing someone like him, an ideal that truly cannot exist. This is why Gran Torino spends so much time scolding All Might, highlighting his flaws as a mentor, and often uses his civilian name. Because, like everyone else, he's human. And so, because Stain didn't have a figure like this in his life, much like the heroes he claims have been corrupted by society, he too succumbed and lost his faith in humanity, brainwashing himself until one day he emerged nothing more than a terrorist. Stain is right in saying that this society is flawed. It isn't perfect, but just like All Might, nothing can be perfect, particularly heroes. If this story has made anything evident, it's that heroes come in all sorts of shapes, sizes, and contend with all of their own problems. So, in the end, all we can really hope for is that there are those out there that have walked that righteous path before us. Those who possess virtuous ideals, ready to take the hands of those that are discouraged or disillusioned and explain to them that, while they will never be perfect, what makes a hero and what's important is to never give up on people to always try your best and to never stop striving for that ideal regardless of the discouraging external factors or the impossibility of the task ahead. Simply because that is what heroes do. In the end, Stain is little more than a scary but sobering cautionary tale. A heartbreaking example of someone who desperately wanted to do something right, one who clearly does hold strong ideals in common with the heroes of this cast, but whose methods cross the line countless times again and again. But the thing about cautionary tales is that when framed the right way, when leveraged by those experienced in manipulation and poison in their hearts, when presented to the right kind of vulnerable person, those tales can become urban legends, an ideal or a story that is told again and again that can inspire other lost souls to embrace hatred and violence in the name of what they believe is a worthy cause. And that is terrifying. Not just because of what it means for the story moving forward, but what it says about the real world.
What made this story one of my favourites and one that scared me was the reaction it garnered from those who consumed it, and what that reaction then told me about the world we live in today. I know for a fact that there are those out there that when they first consumed this story saw Stain as correct. That they saw the very real point that he was making, saw characters like Endeavor, the corruption of hero society, and therefore concluded that Stain's methods were justified. At the beginning of my coverage for this series, I said that my love and appreciation for it stemmed from its ability to feel real, true to life, and unfortunately, nothing feels more real than the reaction I've seen some folks share for Stain. <sighs> okay, that's the philosophical vortex that is Stain finally done with. We'll put him over there for now. We don't have to look at him anymore. Bad Stain. Alright, time for more action-packed and emotionally draining exam shit! Okay, for real, let's just chill. The pre-exam intro to this arc is really straightforward with not a lot to analyze. It's essentially a moment for Deku to demonstrate the improved application of his quirk for the class and specifically for Bakugo so that he can be extra mad doing his best Vegeta impression. Of this prelude material to the main entree that is the final exams, the conversation and ultimate exploration into the story and history of All For One and One For All is the most vital. There's a heavy emphasis on All Might intentionally being selective about what information he reveals, and through that highlights another weakness he possesses. Also through this, we're offered some exposure to the idea that Shigaraki is this world's analogue to Midoriya, only, you know, evil. And while I haven't yet seen their clash, I fully expect it to be awesome. Eventually. But enough of that, on to the show! <laughs> Unlike the prior two arcs, which explored existential dread, the nuanced ethics of hero work, and a whole lot of murder, like way too much murder, the final exams follow Class 1A as they navigate the last challenge of their school year, a tag team conflict with the teachers from UA themselves. Although a simple narrative, Horikoshi's aim with this arc is to force unlikely pairings together in the hopes that their unlikely dynamics create fun opportunities for character development and thrilling action. And spoiler alert, I ended up coming away from a specific battle with an appreciation for something I never had prior. While there is, of course, a heavy emphasis placed on the budding bromance between Deku and Bakugo, as there often is with their will they, won't they, for God's sakes, kiss already! I thought Horikoshi offered plenty of space for characters that hadn't had a chance to shine just yet. Yaoyarozu teaming with Todoroki is a prime example of this. As a character that does exceptionally well in the theory department, but disproportionately underperforms in the practical application of her quirk, we finally get to explore the insecurities Yayorozu has surrounding her own physical limitations, or the limitations she thinks she has. Having been introduced as someone supremely confident, someone who, like Todoroki, got in on special recommendation, as time passed and she realized how good everyone else truly was, her confidence waned and caused her to feel like she wasn't worthy of being in Class 1A at all. Branching out even more, another team to watch is Kaminari and Ashido. Clearly the comedic duo to follow in this section, having been pegged as the least intellectually gifted of the class, Horikoshi saw the perfect chance to pair them up against the principal whose quirk is super intelligence. I suppose to create an opportunity for them to figure out a solution together or to at least formulate a strategy. Within this test, there are two ways to win. You either attack to win, in the case of Bakugo and Deku, they would need to defeat All Might, or run to win, meaning they would need to get past All Might to a certain safe zone, all within a 30 minute time limit. Now, naturally Bakugo has his preferred approach, and so does Deku, but neither seem to agree. Unlike many of the other teams, Deku and Bakugo's pairing hasn't been informed or recontextualized by this written exam like Yaoyorozu's or Ashido's has. The two rivals place third and fourth respectively, and while they get something of a verbal exchange prior, it's nothing we haven't already seen in other arcs time and again. And so what this arc does uniquely offer their pairing is the necessity for diplomacy. The need to communicate and work together to form a compromise. To kick things off, Yayorozu's teaming up with Todoroki begins with him taking the lead, establishing the game plan and offering an intelligent solution to a potentially serious problem that someone like Aizawa brings to the table with his quirk. Through telling her to constantly work to create small objects, that acts as a constant indicator of whether or not Aizawa can see them. On its face, it's an incredibly elegant solution with plenty of built-in precaution. And while Todoroki is enjoying uncontested cooperation from someone too unsure of herself to speak up, 
Bakugo is met with consistent disagreement. The moment All Might attacks and reveals himself to them as their villain, Deku is left stunned, while Bakugo, who must feel a comparative level of pressure, is the one to actually channel All Might, meeting this formidable challenge with a smile. However, as made evident through their approaches, both participants are preventing each other from successfully achieving their shared goal. We know why Deku wants to run away, he treats All Might like this unstoppable deity. All the while, we don't yet have any idea why Bakugo is so gung-ho on his approach to always attack beyond simply trying to prove himself physically. Well, that is until we hear this exchange. <laughs> I'll win, that's what heroes do. I love this scene and sequence because through highlighting a stark difference in their approach, it reveals that they are far more alike than ever we once thought. Much like Deku, Bakugo has tremendous reverence for All Might and his prowess. As a child, he adored the notion of a hero that could face any situation, no matter how outmatched, and still find a way to emerge victorious. With this now revealed to us, it doesn't take a genius to understand that for every moment Bakugo saw Deku get preferential treatment from All Might or all the instances he might have felt looked over by him, that he must have been truly hurt. And yet, much the same as Deku, much the same as his hero All Might, Bakugo continues to fight to his last breath, unwilling to bend to the lofty odds in front of him, unwilling to join forces with Deku, even if it means he loses. This is a neat moment that shows off Deku's determination to push those around him to find a way past their problems, but that again is only one half of what makes this sequence so damn fun for me. Because while it was a necessary part of this battle for Deku's resolve to snap Bakugo out of the pit his ego had trapped him in, Bakugo too is offered the chance much like he was with Kirishima, to explain his rationale behind his simple attack first strategy. As Deku reveals, he sees no path forward either running away from or fighting All Might head on. That's his problem, like an extension of the very issue Gran Torino brought to his attention manifesting in another area of his life. Whereas for Bakugo, instead of being paralyzed by reverence, he uses this respect, this challenge, as motivation, putting forth a clever plan of attack that will create the perfect opening to run. Their first true compromise. Now, with Todoroki having been taken out of the picture entirely, it places Yagyarozu in the most interesting situation for her character. She, one devoid of confidence, one who was ready to follow Todoroki's lead unquestionably, now needs to rely on her own abilities against someone truly formidable. An interesting footnote to this battle for Todoroki is something Aizawa mentions to him, that he should have involved her in the strategy prior to their eventual encounter, pointing out that while his willingness to look after his teammates was admirable, a true leader amplifies voices and explores suggested solutions to difficult problems. I like this because it doesn't place all the blame or emphasis on Yaoyarozu's faults and offers some opportunity for Todoroki to grow from this experience also. And get this! Her plan is absolutely perfect. Not just in how stupendously practical this contingency she created was, but how incredibly effective it ended up being. And honestly, how could it not? Understanding your enemy is the key to victory and she understood this assignment. Aizawa might have boasted earlier that he knew both of their quirks and took the necessary precautions, but so did Yaoyarozu. With Aizawa being someone whose quirk relies on sight, she knew she needed something that could impede that ability while also remaining innocuous enough to avoid suspicion. These dolls, while they initially looked silly, were the perfect Trojan horse for that plan, a tailor-made strategy with careful precaution and flexible application considered. <laughs> In the end, I like this dynamic between Todoroki and Yao, but with the focus of this sequence on elevating her self-confidence, I think the most clever creative move taken could be seen through Horikoshi's choice of opponent for these two. 
While I've largely spent this section of the video focused on the dynamics offered between those paired together, something to acknowledge is the targeted pressure the teachers offer their students to that directly impacts their dynamic. So let's think trios. All Might's overwhelming strength clearly created the pressure necessary for Bakugo and Deku to coordinate, but the choice of Aizawa for these two is a little more difficult to fully pinpoint, but man, is it ever there. Aizawa's powers are rather unique in that they affect everyone in the exact same way, whereas someone like Bakugo, who can launch a blast from his hand, depending on his target, can experience mixed results. However, in Yao's case, she can still make use of her power by stockpiling her strategy and saving it for later application. And that's exactly what happened. By making Aizawa the teacher Little Miss Creation had to overcome, Horikoshi forced Yao into a scenario that offered her a natural advantage, but only if she had the confidence to stick to her own strategy and employ it. I didn't notice that dynamic the first time I checked the anime out, so this read-through is proving very beneficial. Yao Yorozu and Todoroki are the first team to pass. <laughs> When I think back on this section in its totality, while a very simple arc with a very simple goal, Horikoshi's execution upon the subtle narrative framework he established was very successful. Placing two characters that are very different but remarkably similar together while applying tailored pressure to them, all in the hopes that diamonds will emerge on the other side. In the case of Bakugo and Deku, that was very much the case. Watching these intricate sequences interwoven with some of the most stellar and emotional character work we've ever seen out of Bakugo has to be some of the most cathartic and rewarding elements of what I've covered in this video today. Small details like him erupting from beneath All Might's boot with everything he's got, getting back to his feet, demanding that he not be beneath him, but only asserting such after Deku was thrown out of range. Like I said, it's the small touches that do a remarkable amount of heavy lifting in these closing moments. From Bakugo always wanting to get back up to All Might practically breaking Deku's back to eventually, using a combination of full cowling and a blindsiding punch, Deku hobbles with Bakugo in tow, together taking a gigantic leap in respecting and understanding each other. It's a truly fantastic moment, but one that sparked a series of chapters that unfortunately highlight an issue I've been having with the readability of this manga in spots. I mean, you know me, I'm the manga guy, probably to an annoying degree, staring at you, Yu Yu Hakusho, but I couldn't help but notice the anime's superior approach to flow and clarity throughout many sections of this story. One of the big changes the anime makes in this season is shifting Deku and Bakugo's challenge to the end of the arc, while managing to expand on the other students' exams in segments prior. It not only allowed the central character's conflict to feel more important, but it prevented the feeling of everyone else being a very literal afterthought. So much so that were it not for the anime, I would have had very little idea what had even happened in many of these fights. Take Tsuyu and Takuyami's bout with Ectoplasm, for example. They win by Froppy regurgitating the handcuffs and using Dark Shadow to slap them on the teacher. And all of that is conveyed well with how the anime is storyboarded. We clearly see the handcuffs taken and applied, all while maintaining the mystery about what exactly Tsuyu just coughed up. All the while, the manga shows a panel that I think is meant to be the handcuffs being taken, with the reveal being a close-up of the teacher's peg leg that really made me wonder what on earth I was looking at for a hot second. And it's the same with Ida's fight. The manga just shows holes in the ground and Ida's head sticking out of it, so yeah, basically no idea what's happening here either. Now, these are very much the worst case examples, but similarly problematic paneling can be found in much of these early volumes. In manga design, one of the very big challenges is to know what to illustrate and what to imply through the gutters, the blank spaces between panels. You typically want to show your key poses and leave the rest to the reader's imagination. It allows for impact and the illusion of motion without drawing literal frame-by-frame -frame action. But I think Horikoshi often takes things a little too far, and instead of showing action and follow-through, it can often be action after action that leaves panels feeling quite disconnected from one another. I sort of get the sense he has a big jumbled array of incredible ideas in his head, but isn't always quite clear on how best to put them to page in an easy to understand format. Or perhaps even misguidedly assumes the audience understands every single thing going on in his head and can make sense of what occurs between the panels themselves. I feel it also in the way he sometimes structures dialogue too. 
inner monologues are often interrupted by outward speech, sometimes to the point it becomes unclear as to who's talking, and it can result in a very stutter-stop type of dialogue delivery that in its worst moments can halt the momentum of serious scenes. Take Deku's conversation here with Gran Torino. From panel to panel, it's juggling internal and external speech to the point that nobody can really finish their sentence without being interrupted. It makes for a very jarring read, and the anime solves this by just rearranging the order of the dialogue to prevent that. And in turn, it allows for this big emotional crescendo. The same goes for Ida's big moment against Stain. The manga's got him shouting his attack and talking to himself at the same time. Why? <laughs> I should be turning the page here for a big finish, and the anime does allow for that, but the manga's got this double whammy speech going on that just doesn't align with the big singular impact spread. I'm not actually that upset, to be clear. Horikoshi's art is incredible, and I certainly won't be holding this against him for the moment. I'm seven volumes into this manga that's currently 41 volumes long, so clearly there's a great deal of time to improve on this aspect. It'd be like me yelling at Isayama for his potato attack on Titan art in the early chapters while ignoring the incredible late stuff. But I did want to mention it now so I can see things work out by the time I reach the end of this series. So, back to positivity because boy oh boy, the end of this arc is wild. <laughs> From the moment we were introduced to Shigaraki as a character, he expressed what his mission was, but it seemed like we only knew half of the story. By the time we got into this season, Shigaraki's impact on the series felt even smaller, with the likes of Stain superseding him in not just popularity within the story itself, but through readers' interest also. What I like about this jealousy of Stain is that it exposes the fatal flaw in Shigaraki's approach and, more than that, why he felt like only half a character when he was introduced. He wanted to kill All Might, yes, but outside of childish petulance, never expressed why. Because he didn't know. Which is scary in isolation, but if you want to occupy a leading villain role, you need a little more to you than just that. Through All for One co-opting the Stain Press for Shigaraki's gain, he's offered the follow of two shady but powerful individuals, but again, Instead of leveraging the anonymity and opportunity Stain has given him, he instead childishly lashes out in jealousy. However, something's different. During his attempted attack on Hosu, where he was ultimately overshadowed by Stain's mission, All For One allowed Shigaraki to make serious mistakes, mistakes that ultimately taught him that sometimes you don't need to make rash decisions, and through taking that time, having demonstrated his growth, the perfect opportunity presents itself. Threatening the lives of dozens of civilians and Deku if he tries to so much as move a finger, Shigaraki expresses his frustrations but ultimately concludes that he wants to create a new world. He doesn't believe in justice at all. He thinks it's a fragile concept, a fragile facade, and wants everyone else to accept that reality. His reality. This is his new conviction, and to expose this fact he believes in, he needs to kill all Might. After meeting with Deku at the police station, All Might muses over a contradiction in his life, that he presents himself and wishes he could be someone who can save all the people who need him, but concludes by acknowledging that he's only human. As he stands there before Deku, exhausted and emaciated, he stresses that this is why he believes a symbol for peace is so important to inspire other heroes and to free society from the oppressive dread that the likes of Shigaraki wish to drown the world in. But unfortunately for All Might, the stronger the light, the darker the shadows. In this arc, I decided to focus on the breadth of impact the internal drivers of particular characters have on each other. Through doing so, we've been exposed to toxicity, healing, terror, and now finally, meaning. With All Might's righteous mission brought on by a sense of duty giving rise to the very chaos he wishes to dissuade. It seems for Shigaraki, no matter how great his shadow, there is always an equally mighty light. And for All Might, no matter how hard he fights, there always persists the ever elusive darkness waiting for his moment of weakness. With season three on the horizon, it's clear something big is coming and very soon. Everything surrounding me, leaving me with nothing left to say. 
Imagine.